Good morning. Today's reading is Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Nationwide, there are now more than 2,000 cases of coronavirus and at least 50 deaths. President Trump has declared a state of emergency, and early this morning, the House passed a major spending package to help Americans impacted by the crisis. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. Landlord says my rent is late. He's going to have to litigate, but don't worry, be happy. <laughs> is that what it is? Don't worry, be happy? I have somebody in the church that noticed that I tend to say the phrase to people a lot, it's okay. So they gave me a shirt embroidered with that, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. But we are worried, aren't we? We're worried about basic things, about shelter and about how close do we get to each other. We're worried about whether we'll have food and simple things, just like these people were concerned. But toilet paper? Come on. I mean, really, you know? What do you got, a pile of it in the basement about 20 feet high? I read about some guy in the paper today who decided he was going to cash in on this. So he bought himself like 10,000 of these uh, sanitizing little things, right? And he's going to sell them on eBay for like 50 bucks a piece. Or Amazon it was. Amazon shut him down. Now he's stuck with them and he's trying to figure out what to do. I know what he can do, right? We all know what he can do. Give them away, you fool. You already made your money. Give them away. It's difficult. Don't worry. Jesus, in another passage of Scripture, says, don't be anxious about anything. We are. It's natural that we have some anxiety, and it's natural that we need to be prepared to some degree at least for today, for tomorrow, and even for eternity. So don't be anxious. Don't be worried. It doesn't mean... Don't be prepared. Don't be wise. I'm not taking any cruises right now, right? You may have noticed for most of you that someone opened the door. Thank you, gentlemen. That's that many less hands touching the handle coming in. Even though we sanitized them, you know, the first one who reaches it, the sick, right? You might notice that it's a little different in here this morning. Yeah, we've been asked to do this for good reason, because it's smart to be prudent and be prepared. We've been telling parables as we talk about kingdom living, and one of the parables that I want to share with you is called the ten virgins. There were five virgins that brought a lamp with some extra oil and five virgins that just brought the lamps. They were going to a wedding banquet because they are preparing to be married to the bridegroom. Now, don't get all weird about ten women and one guy, okay? Because this is really to represent us as the church. We're the bride of Christ, right? And Christ, 
And there's a lot of us. Some came prepared. Some didn't. So they all had a dress. They all had lamps. They all had what looked like the form that they needed. But some were missing the oil. The time came for the bridegroom to come through town. And the cry went out, the bridegroom is, is here. So they all lit their lamps. Anybody ever light a lamp without oil in it? It burns real good for about 10 seconds. And then the wick burns out. And so they said to the other virgins, share some of yours. And this is where it really bothers us. <laughs> they said, we can't do that. You have to go get your own. We're all like, what? But you see, the story of the passage is not about whether or not some of the virgins were greedy or not or, or, or such. We'll talk about that a little later. It's about the fact that some were prepared and some were not. Don't worry, be prepared. It's fascinating, we actually picked this passage for today back in January. Isn't that fun? It shows up today as we're going through the, the scriptures. What's the oil that you can't share with someone else but is essential for us as Christians when we look forward to our God coming? And it's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's God living in us. It's the indwelling spirit. I, I can talk to you about what God has done in my life. I can talk to you about how God has changed me. I can talk to you about how God has changed others. I can share with you all sorts of stories. But I can't put the Holy Spirit in your heart. I can't share that oil, that power. You have to make that decision for yourself. The kingdom of God is like ten virgins who went out and some were prepared and some were not. In this passage in verse 33 it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the rest of life will take care of itself. Because life is more than just clothes and food. And, and, and God knows we need those. But life is more than just surviving or just existing. We inherited a, a, a double wide trailer from my in-laws down in Florida. Anybody ever been to one of those retirement communities in Florida? This is how a segment of them, not all of them, but a segment of them live. They get up in the morning and they spend about an hour drinking coffee while they think about what they're going to eat for breakfast. <laughs> then they eat breakfast, and they do the dishes, and they figure out how they're going to waste another hour or two before the mail comes, because that is the highlight of the day. When the mail comes, they all go running through the park. The mail is here! The mail is here! It's really freaky, but that's what they do, okay? These people go nuts about the mail. They get the mail, and now they just don't know what to do at all. So they sit and they watch golf or a, or a soap opera or something while they're waiting for 4 o'clock. Because at 4 o'clock, they start drinking. And they start drinking, and they drink till about 7 when they pass out and get up the next day and do it again. There's a whole bunch of people that that's what they do with their lives. That's surviving. That's not living. Now, some of you might sound, say, that sounds like a pretty cool day. It might be a cool day. It might even be a cool week. But it's not a cool life. Because life is more than just existing. They're like the, the virgins who had lamps, but they had no oil. They didn't have the, the power in their lives that made all the difference. People... Chase after things. Jesus says it this way. The pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows you need them. Or in other words, people who have no God in their lives, they don't have any of that sense of the Holy Spirit of God. All they do is spend their time chasing like hamsters on a wheel. 
after the things they are certain they have to have. Uh, there was a question about should we close church today. I have to tell you that's something that I, I consider in prayer. And I'd like all your opinions and all your ideas and I want to hear them. Because it's not a decision that you make lightly to shut down the opportunity for people to worship God. And it's not a consideration you make lightly to question whether you put people at risk. Do you, you follow? So we pray about that. We have to consider that. But you see, worship is an important piece of who we are. The very act of worship means that we have come here because we believe there's something more in life than just existing. Amen? Because if all we want to do is just exist, just survive another day, just go on a little bit longer, why would we go to worship at all? What would be the point? We come to worship because we believe that God has a dream for us that is greater than just being alive. In fact, we believe that we're not even alive if we don't have that dream. People chase after these things, and we all need these basic things. God knows that. But what inspires our lives to dream, to reach for something that's greater than just getting through the day till 4 o'clock so that we can anesthetize ourselves for the rest of the evening. And God says that there is a dream like that. I can't imagine being the president of the United States right now. Could you? Who would ever want this job? I am, I am totally astounded. Anybody wants to be president, really. I don't ever want to be president. I wouldn't even want to think about such a thing. I wouldn't want to have to make a decision for the entire nation. It's a struggle making a decision for all of you. But we're going to have to select a president, right? We're going to have an election where we will choose who will be our leader. We've been talking about how kingdom living is not American living. And one of the difficulties we have when we are told that we need to enter into the kingdom of God, we need to seek after the kingdom of God, is we've been told as a culture, kings are bad. We reject kings. We want nothing to do with that whole way of life. And yet God tells us we need to strive for that. Makes a confusion for us, doesn't it? Because kings are not elected. Kings are not elected, they're selected. And you know who selects kings? It's not the people. There was a story in the Bible about a time when God felt the nation of Israel needed a new king because he didn't really particularly care for the king that was there at the time, a guy by the name of Saul. So he said to Samuel, the great prophet, go down and anoint a king from the family of Jesse. So he went down and he saw in Jesse's family, there was a big, tall, strong-looking guy, the oldest one. He said, that's got to be the guy. And God said, no, that's not the guy. And he went down all the sons that Jesse had. And God said, nope. Nope, nope, nope. And Samuel said, is there any more? I said, well, yeah, there's the runt who's out in the field watching the sheep, but he's the runt. You don't want him. Bring him in, let's see. And he came in, and God said, that's the one. A man after my own heart. And he anointed King David with oil. Because not only did God choose David, he then inspired, inspired David, put the power of the Holy Spirit so that David had all the gifts that a leader of a nation needed to have. Because when God chooses someone for a purpose, he gives them every attribute needed to accomplish that purpose. Boy. What would it look like if God chose our president? Now, I like to believe when you go in to pull that lever, you don't think, what does my party say or, 
or, or even what does my mind say, but what does my God want me to do? I hope you pray before you go to vote, and you should all go vote. That's our system. And then maybe we can believe that God works through the hearts and minds and souls of all the people of this country to choose a leader. I don't know. I really kind of like the idea of knowing my leader was anointed, chosen, selected, empowered, and gifted by God. Wouldn't that be wonderful to actually believe that? That's what the kingdom living is about. That's what the people who lived in the kingdom believed. And that's what we're asked to do with God. Because it's not just about kings. It's about what did God create you and I for? I had a young woman who graduated recently. She was talking to me. And uh, she told me what her degree was in. And I thought, good luck getting a job. I know that. I have a history degree. You know what a history degree will get you a job in? I worked in lawn care. Yeah. It doesn't get you anything. It was actually pretty good for a pastor, but I didn't know about that or think about that at the time. And, and she was feeling discouraged. I could tell. She, was, she, she was said she was looking for a job. Now, you know what a job is. Most of you have probably worked one. A job is this. You go out and you do something for money. So if somebody gave you like $3 million, you would be like walking away and not even calling the boss to let them know you're not coming in. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's a job. Anybody here ever work a job? I worked a job. I worked a lot of jobs. All right? But when God gifts us and God calls us for something, it's entirely different. Because now he has decided that he has already put in you the exact things you need to be empowered with to make that happen. And so I told this young woman, I said, God created you for a purpose. Before you were even born, I don't think anybody ever said that to her. I said, before you were even born, God looked at you and said he had a purpose for your life. She's young. You people who are young, not old like me. Even if you're old like me. <laughs> Remember Moses, 80 years old? God has reason, a purpose for you. And it's not what will pay the most money. It, it's not what will make everybody around us happy. It's about what will make our lives worth living. Because we're not here that long. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So a number of years ago, uh, when God was pestering me about being a pastor, which I thought was a totally ridiculous idea, by the way, I thought that was absurd. I said, you know who you're talking to? I am not pastor material. I knew that. But for some reason, he continued. So finally, I made the decision. And so one of the things I did to prepare for going into the ministry is I took my wife out to the Adams Mark Hotel restaurant. Anybody ever been to Adams Mark? It was great. I mean, we had a gift certificate for $100, which in 1985 was real money. Okay? And we spent $130. <laughs> we had a heck of a meal. And then we went, I said, let's take a walk. So we walked outside the hotel, and there was a, a carriage waiting there. And I said, hey, Jackie, let's get in the carriage and take a ride. She said, no, 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 Tom, that's for somebody special. The guy came around and said, Mr. and Mrs. Kraft, <laughs> that's for somebody special. And we rode around downtown a little bit, and I pulled out some ruby earrings. My wife has told me I've got a proclivity for ruby earrings. But anyways, I pulled out some ruby earrings and gave them to her. And she said, why are you doing this? I said, because we are going to be dirt poor for the rest of our lives. And we will never, ever, ever do anything like this again. Because God wants me to be a pastor, and I know pastors are dirt poor. So I just want you to be prepared. This is the last time we're ever going to do anything nice. It's a funny thing, isn't it? When we live into God's dream, we are absolutely convinced it can't work. We're going to be poor. Things aren't going to be right. Everybody won't be happy. I couldn't even imagine anybody would even come to hear me talk. Why would they? I was just a, a kid from Cheektowaga. What do I know about anything? 
But if you seek first the kingdom of God, living into what God has created you for so that you will be anointed, you will be empowered for what it is that God made you for, everything else will fall in line. Does that mean you won't have any problems? Of course not. When he says don't worry about tomorrow, do you think that means everything will be fine? When I say it's okay, I'm not saying everything will be perfect. I see more people die than most of you have ever even imagined. I see more people get sick and talk to more people who are sick than anybody except for those who work in the healthcare industry. But if we get our priorities on God, the anxiety, the worry, can and will diminish. I, I love this last verse in the passage. I think it's the best part of this passage, really. He says, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Which sounds great, right? But then he adds in, each day has enough trouble of its own. <laughs> Why'd you say that? Oh my gosh. You see, when we worry about tomorrow, what we're doing is we're borrowing problems from tomorrow that may not even happen. Do you follow? We're creating anxieties about something that, that hasn't even happened and may not. How many of you have spent anxious moments worried about something that never, ever, ever happens? And all you did is expend tremendous energies on nothing. You're going to have enough toilet paper. <laughs> Relax. If you don't, I'll give you a roll. Really. And some people here got enough to last forever. We're going to do a toilet paper drive for the poor in about three months, man. The place will be packed with toilet paper. <laughs> it's not helpful to borrow problems from tomorrow because we have real problems today. That's what he's telling us. He's not saying there aren't problems, and he's not even saying there won't be problems tomorrow. He's saying we have real problems today. Are we going to have a fish fry next week? I don't know. Is the church going to have to close down? I don't know. Somebody asked me, well, then, then what about the people that work here? I said, well, they might not get paid. I don't know. We don't get unemployment. We're not eligible. Some are. Most of us aren't. I don't know. I can spend my hours in, in agony about tomorrow, or I can just live in today, because today has real concerns. I had an older woman in our church who has health issues, and, and she said to me that the person who runs her building said she's not allowed to go to church. And I said to her, well, he can't tell you you can't go to church. <laughs> he can't do that. I said, but you know, you probably shouldn't. Okay? She's got health concerns. She has issues that, that could cause, not, not the coronavirus, but, but any, any illness could cause her a serious problem. Maybe it's not so good. Or maybe, you know, if she comes, she ought to sit way in the back, back there, like some of you are doing, and that's okay, right? I thought about putting a couple single chairs out, just, you know, people could sit completely like, you know, I get it. We have enough real problems today that we don't want to get paralyzed and stuck because we add in the anxieties about tomorrow that will freeze us. We want to be clear-minded and prepared. Like the five virgins who prepared by having the oil in their lamps, but not so anxious that we lose all sense of what life is about. The coronavirus reminds us that we're fragile. It reminds us that we're mortal. I mean, we, we really are. You know, I don't know about you. Well, I do know about you. We all risk our lives every day. Do you know how many people were killed in an automobile accident last year in America? 40,000 people. How many of you drove here today? Yeah. You risked your life. Literally, risked your life. When I find myself going to a hospital and, 
and as I go to visit somebody who is really looking for me to come, some of them waiting for me to come to pray before their surgery, and they say I got to put on gloves and a mask and a gown, and I know that might be to protect them, but it sure feels like it's because they got something I don't want to get. You know what I mean? I was in an isolation room once. <laughs> Everybody comes in dressed like, a, like an astronaut. So you kind of wonder what's going on. But you go in the room because that's what you need to do. If somebody is, is a shut in and stuck at home and can't get out and needs some food, you don't say, sorry, I might get coronavirus for you. You go and get them some food, amen? We take care of them. We look after each other. We, we, we need to live our lives, and we are going to risk our lives every day. And the coronavirus reminds us we're fragile. And so we need to be prepared. We need the essentials. And yes, we need food. And yes, we need water. And yes, we probably even need some toilet paper. Okay? But we also need the essential that not only guides and gets us through this life, but gets us to the next one. Because the purpose of this life is to get to the next, right? So we need to be prepared as the five virgins were because our king knows what we need and he's working on it. But this is a broken world and things will happen to all of us somewhere along the line. But in the midst of our worries and our troubles and even our fears, we need to trust in God. Now, I looked up a song because I thought this song fits so perfect for my sermon. I was just going to play one verse of it because it sounded so neat, right? But have you ever read the little comments on these things? I don't do that very often, but, you know, after a verse of it, I scrolled down as I was listening. This is a song, and the woman singing it, her name is Melinda Hill. Her husband put this together. Because Melinda Hill sang this song after she had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and told she had seven months to live. And yet she sang this song. I don't Oh, 
I was only going to play one verse, and then I read that story about her, and I thought, if a woman facing terminal cancer, knowing, knowing, not fearful, knowing, she only has a handful of months to live, can have that kind of faith. That's a message for all of us. Are we prepared? Do we have the power of God? Do we have the living Holy Spirit welling up inside us to show us who to be, what to do, where to go, how to live, empowering us for life? Have we taken care of simple issues? Yes, have a little food in the house. Get a few rolls of toilet paper. I don't want to deliver it to you. But then go out and live. Some of the virgins make it to eternity and some didn't. The biggest issue is not are you ready for the next five weeks? But are you ready for eternity? Are you ready? Because the coronavirus reminds us our time here is limited. I risk my life every day. In lots of ways I don't even think about. And yes, the virus will come. Even the government doesn't have any any delusions about that. They're not trying to stop it. They're just trying to slow it down so it doesn't overwhelm things. Because some people are going to get sick. Most, according to what they say, will recover, just like the flu. The economy will come back at some point. The experts are telling us, be clean. So we're wiping stuff down. I brought some of my wife's secret stash, Lysol wipes from home. (laughs) For you. (laughs) I had to sneak them out of the house. No, I didn't. That's only a joke. (laughs) She has plenty. (laughs) Be careful. Don't be foolish, wise as serpents, gentle as doves. Be prepared, and you know, if you're vulnerable, then maybe you need to stay home a little more. But then live. Because if we seek the kingdom of God, God will take care of the rest of these things. It's okay. It's okay. I know you're a little worried, but it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Even those way in the back. It's okay. It's okay. God still has you in the palm of his hand. It really is okay. I want you to be safe. I want you to be smart. I want you to live as God designed you to live. Linda told me she brought extra toilet paper, so if you're out, she's got some in the back for you. (laughs) People think everything at church, right? God is still holding us. God is still with us. Not just now, but right on riding into eternity. So live, and live wise in the power and wonder of Jesus Christ. Go in his peace. Amen.